we'll discuss the z-test and hypothesis testing. Imagine our research question is, does an early childhood diet rich in vitamins and minerals improve IQ? Based on that question, we have our research hypothesis, a prediction which states the intervention will result in above average performance on a standardized IQ test. And then of course, there's always a null hypothesis, which says no difference or in the opposite direction. So that is, the intervention will result in a similar or worse performance than the general population. For research, we go out there and we collect data. In this case, we'll sample 25 people randomly from the population and we'll ensure that they have a diet rich in vitamins and minerals from the age of six months to five years of age. Then, once they reach 18 years old, we'll go ahead and give them a standardized IQ test. We know that for a standardized IQ test, that it can have a specific mean and standard deviation. Several of them are designed so that the mean is 100, the standard deviation is 16, and it's a nice normal distribution. Here is a graph showing what we might expect for an IQ test given to the general population. Someone right here is showing an IQ of 100, which is the mean. This person over here has an IQ of 132. And that person is two standard deviations above the mean. And this person with an 84 is one standard deviation below the mean. Think about the empirical rule, which says that 68% of the population is within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. In this case, where the mean is 100, standard deviation is 16. That means that 68% of the population has an IQ between 84 and 116. Likewise, according to the empirical rule, 95% of the population is within two standard deviations of the mean. Or in this case, that would be 95% are between 68 and 132. So let's go ahead and record the data of our 25 participants. Here's the first five, and we can add some more as we go along. And now we have all 25 participants and their sample mean came out to be 100.7. Numerically, 100.7 is greater than the general population mean of 100. But should we go celebrate? Or should we consider the possibility that this could just be random error? That is, every time we sample 25 people from the population, even if our treatment has no impact at all, sometimes the sample mean will be above average, sometimes it will be below average. Rarely, very rarely would it fall exactly on 100. Now for our sample mean, we actually can look at it within the context of the distribution of sample means. That is, a sample mean is based upon 25 people. If we went out there and got another 25 people, we could record their sample mean. Another 25 people record their sample mean. If we did that enough times, we might get nine sample means, and we could actually keep doing that theoretically for 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000. So you would actually have this distribution of sample means for all the possible samples of size 25 drawn from the general population. Why would we do this? Because we want to know, is a sample mean of 100.7 unusual? Should we be surprised? Should we say, this is not likely to happen due to chance, something else may have been causing it. Let's reject the null hypothesis and instead support the research hypothesis. Hypothesis testing is all about, was this result unexpected, unusual, surprising. Now, we can apply the empirical rule to this distribution of sample means, just like we could to a set of individual scores. So we know that 68% of sample means, of samples of size 25, will be between plus and minus one standard error of 100. So that means 68% of all sample means will be between 97.8 and 103.2. Likewise, 95% of all sample means will be within two standard errors of the population mean of 100. So that means 95% of the sample means will be between 93.6 and 106.4. So getting a sample mean in this range isn't particularly exciting. It's not particularly unusual. If it were you know, more extreme, uh, then it might get our attention. So here's our 25 participants again. Sample mean of 100.7. Here are the steps that we go through in deciding whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. Number one, you look for the given information typically provided by your instructor. Number two, calculate the standard error. Three, set the Z critical. Four, calculate the Z test. Five, decide whether to retain or reject the null hypothesis. So that given information 
It's the research hypothesis, in this case that the population mean of all people given the specialized diet rich in minerals, vitamins, that their average IQ on a standardized IQ test is expected to be at greater than 100. The null hypothesis is that it would be less than or equal to 100. And we're also told for the Z test that the population mean is 100 and the population standard deviation is 16. And anytime you do a Z test, the distribution needs to be normal and you need to know the population standard deviation. And of course, not covered at, in this particular presentation, but the central limit theorem does say that for pretty much any distribution shape, by the time that the sample size gets to around 30 or so, you can count on that distribution of sample means being fairly normal. Okay, and our evidence, our evidence was 100.7 and our sample size was 25. Step two, you calculate the standard error of the mean. Our standard error is equal to standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. Our standard deviation is 16. Our sample size is 25. 16 over the square root of 25 is equal to 16 over 5, or 3.2. Then we set our Z critical so that our alpha level is 0.05. So our Z critical for this one tail test is a positive 1.645, and the distribution, portion of the distribution to the right of that is 0.05. So if the null hypothesis is correct, 0.05 of the time, we'll get a sample mean that will fall in our rejected zone. Step four, you calculate the z-test. That's the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error. In this case, it's 100.7 minus 100 divided by 3.2, or 0.7 over 3.2. That works out to be 0.22. That 0.22 lets us know that the sample mean is 0.22 standard errors above where the null hypothesis expects it to be. So here's our list again for evaluating the null hypothesis. Number one, you look through the given information. Two, you calculate the standard error. That worked out to 3.2 in this case. Step three, you set the Z critical. For a one-tail test, we're expecting the sample mean to benefit from the treatment. Our Z critical is a positive 1.645. Step four, you calculate the Z test. The Z test was 0.22. And step five, you decide whether to retain or reject the null hypothesis. We're going to be retaining the null hypothesis in this case. The result is not statistically significant. Since the z-test was not greater than or equal to the z-critical, we'll retain the null hypothesis, right? Our, our z-test was 0.22. That means the sample mean just was not far enough from where the null hypothesis says it should have been to make this result surprising. Or unusual. Note that the sample mean was not in the reject zone, right? So our sample mean needed to be at least 1.645 standard errors or more away from where the null hypothesis says it should be for us to reject the null. So if we were to write this up APA style, we would say there is not a statistically significant difference between the treatment group's performance on the IQ test, m equals 100.7, n equals 25, and that of the general population, uppercase M equals 100, uppercase S equals 16, Z test equals 0.22, P greater than 0.05. Several of those letters italicized. And so again, our Z test 0.22 it just wasn't big enough. It was too small. And our P value, on the other hand, was too large. It was 0.41. It needed to be 0.05 or less. Now let's consider some other scenarios. What if our sample mean had been 101.6? Right, that's a, a higher uh, value than, than what we actually saw. For 101.6, the z-test would work out to be 0.5, saying that our sample mean is half a standard error above where it was expected based upon the null. P-value of 0.31, saying that, yeah, it's, that's not unusual you know, to get a sample mean this far away. We're going to retain the null. Now, what if our sample mean was 105.4? Well, we got a z-test of 1.69. That meets or exceeds the z-critical. P-value, in this case, 0.05. We reject the null. And here's how it would look if written up APA style. There is a statistically significant difference between the treatment group's performance on the IQ test, m equals 105.4, n equals 25, and that of the general population, uppercase m equals 100, uppercase s equals 16, z-test equals 1.69, p less than or equal to 0.05, several of those letters italicized. 
Let's take a more extreme example. Let's say our sample mean was 107.2. Well, 107.2 is 2.25 standard errors above the null hypothesis specified mean of 100. So that's pretty good, right? And the p-value, 0.01. So note that because the z-test meets or exceeds the z-critical, we could reject the null. Because the p-value is less than or equal to alpha level of 0.05, we could reject the null. So two different ways to know you can reject the null. And finally, we see that our sample mean is here in this reject zone. So here we have a sample mean of 97.1. This is below 100, right? We said that this diet would improve uh, performance in IQ tests, and here these people did worse. Null hypothesis says that the intervention will result in similar or worse performance. So 97.1 is covered under worse performance. As it doesn't matter how extreme the sample mean gets, it will still fall in this criteria as similar or worse performance. So for a sample mean of 97.1, the z-test is negative 0.91. It's almost one standard below. P-value is 0.82. That is starting from the right tail and making our way to the left all the way to 97.1. Getting a, a sample mean in this range happens 0.82 of the time in terms of probability. For a sample mean of 90.1, our z-test is a negative 3.08 more than three standard errors below the mean. P-value essentially rounds to the hundredth place to a p-value of one. So often you think high p-value, wow, it's amazing. But in this case, no. I would mean that this is a extremely common. You can't get much more extremely common you know, in this case. We're only interested in something that's surprising. Surprising events have low probability of occurring, not high probability. So because this probability was not 0.05 or less, it was, it was one, we're going to retain the null. And likewise, because our z-test of negative 3.08 was below our z-critical, we'll retain the null. So let's come back to our research question. Does an early childhood diet rich in vitamins and minerals improve IQ? Research hypothesis says that the intervention will result in above average performance on a standardized IQ test. Null hypothesis is that no difference or in the opposite direction. So that is the intervention will result in similar or worse performance in the general population. We went through our five steps for hypothesis testing to evaluate as a sample mean of 100.7 statistically significant. We began by looking through the given information. Typically, that's going to be the population mean and the population standard deviation, and we'll find the sample mean and the sample size. Step two, we'll calculate the standard error. Step three, we'll set our Z critical so that our alpha level is 0.05, and we'll decide whether it's a one-tail or two-tail test. Step four, we'll calculate the Z test, and step five, we decide whether to retain or reject the null hypothesis. So we decided to retain the null hypothesis that a specialized diet high in uh, vitamins and minerals will have no impact on a standardized IQ performance. Was that the right decision? Did we make the correct decision to retain the null? That will be discussed in our subsequent video.